Okay, it's a pleasure to have uh, Ashish Clark with us from University of Chicago. Uh, I've got his PhD from Cornell in 2001, and then I, I, after a postdoc at Yale uh, between 2001 and 2004, he moved on to uh, as a professor at McGill University, uh, Canada, where he spent close to 13 years. And then more recently in 2017, he, he moved to University of Chicago. Uh, within quotes, a warmer place than Montreal. And uh, he has won uh, several recognitions for his uh, very fascinating research. And he has been a Simons Fellow in Theoretical Physics and more recently a Simons Investigator in Theoretical Physics. And he has been an Alfred Sloan Fellow. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Ashish Clerk and he's going to tell us how to make money in game stop stocks. <laughs> Great, so thanks a lot, Saram, for the introduction and the, uh, the invitation to speak here. I still remember, and I'm not gonna quote a year or something, I think the first time I met Saram, I was trying to recruit him as a postdoc. I failed, but I see I had good taste at least. It's good to see you've done really well. Um, yeah, so the title of this talk, One Way Quantum Interactions for Fun and Profit. I'm gonna tell you about a, a really kind of large direction of theory work in my group where we've been trying to do something that at first glance just seems impossible and crazy. Can we design interactions really at the quantum level between systems where the interactions go in one direction? So system A influences system B. System B has no influence whatsoever on system A. Okay, and I have this sort of flippant title, um, One Way Interactions for Fun and Profit. So the fun part is, if you could really realize these, these quantum one-way interactions, it opens up the door to a host of new kinds of physical phenomena, right? So even new kinds of many body effects, new kinds of topological physics, I'll hopefully say a little bit about that. The for-profit thing is maybe a, a bit of an exaggeration, but these one-way interactions can be incredibly useful for practical devices. And many of you already know that, in terms of the worlds of, of just classical photonics or electromagnetics, but even in the world of what I'll describe as quantum engineering, having these funny unidirectional interactions could really let you do some, some great things. So in this talk, I'll try to give you a, a gentle introduction to sort of the ideas here. The basic theory ideas involve these kind of buzzwords that maybe you've heard, the idea of non-Hermitian quantum physics, something called quantum reservoir engineering. So I'll try to explain what those words mean. I'll try to convince you that this isn't just a theorist having gone insane. You can connect to experiments. So I'll tell you about an experiment that implements some of these ideas to get a one-way interaction between mechanical modes. And then in the, in the very last part of the talk, I'll tell you about some connections to a kind of novel topological effect. Okay, so, and uh, before I go on, it's good to sort of credit the people who really did the work. So within my group, a lot of the ideas I'm telling you about were really worked out with a postdoc who was in my group, Anya Mettelman, who is now um, an Emmy Noether Fellow at the Free University in Berlin. And also uh, a current PhD student in my group, Alex McDonald, was also heavily involved in this work. And in terms of the experiments I'll tell you about, those were done in Jack Harris's group at Yale. And the postdoc that really led those experiments was Haitan Zhu, who is now a professor at Peking University. Okay, so this is a colloquium, so it's always nice to give a really big picture kind of introduction. The ideas I'll tell you about are actually interesting both in classical and quantum settings, but the motivation for us, why we started thinking about this, really comes from this world of what I like to call quantum engineering. And so the basic idea of quantum engineering is can we harness some of the, the most unusual features of quantum physics, entanglement superposition, to maybe do something useful? Okay, maybe something useful in information processing, quantum computing, maybe new modes of sensing, maybe new ways of doing um, you know, secure communication. And the focus is sort of on engineered quantum systems, the sort of top-down man-made systems where you really, or the experimentalists really, have a lot of control over the systems uh, involved. And so, oops, here are three examples of systems that we think about theoretically, our experimental colleagues actually you know, work on. So what are you looking at here? You're looking at a thin film of aluminum that's sort of been patterned 
And again, the length scale here is 300 microns. So the, the width of a human hair is like, I don't know, 50 microns. So this blue region here, this kind of teeth-like structure, these are just two plates of a capacitor. Okay, so that's like a parallel plate capacitor. And linking those two plates, if you really zoom in here, that's a superconducting tunnel junction. So you could really think of that if you want as a very fancy kind of inductor. So this is a very, you know, kind of small, fancy, superconducting LC circuit. This is actually the, the workhorse uh, kind of superconducting qubit. So this is a transmon qubit. This is what IBM and Google and others are really pushing to maybe build a quantum computer one day. This is an example of one of these engineered quantum systems. Okay, another kind of system, similar length scale. So the, the length here is maybe 50 microns. This is coming from Oscar Painter's lab at Caltech. So this is a silicon beam that's been patterned with holes. And you can see the hole spacing is kind of, you know, there's a defect if you want in this regular spacing in the middle. So this is what's known as an optomechanical crystal, right? This defect in this spacing of holes basically localizes both a photonic mode, so an electromagnetic mode of light, right in the middle of the defect. It also localizes uh, an acoustic mode, a vibrational mode of the beam. So this is a really cool system if you want to understand the interaction of mechanical motion and light at the quantum level. Okay, so another interesting engineered quantum system. The last example um, that I have on the right here, here you're looking at electrons in a two-dimensional electron gas in some semiconductor heterostructure. On top of that, these light regions are metallic gates that further confine electrons to these little box regions. So these are basically two quantum dots, right? Two places where I could have electrons. This is another interesting way to try to build uh, you know, a qubit, maybe a technology for a quantum computer. Okay, so all of these are engineered quantum systems. There's some degrees of freedom that we'd like to have behave quantum mechanically in an interesting way. Maybe the sloshing of charge between those two capacitor plates, maybe the motion of this beam. If I step back and ask, what is the problem that I as a theorist have to face with these systems? It's basically making sense of this cartoon. So there are some degrees of freedom that we'd like to have in an interesting quantum state. That's this blue circle. The interesting quantum state is this, this cat side. The problem is in these systems, the interesting degrees of freedom are coupled to all sorts of things, right? And a way of describing that is to say, we have dissipation, right? So energy can leak out of the systems or the degrees of freedom I care about. And also from that environment, from all of those other degrees of freedom, noise can actually enter the system. Okay, so at a very basic level, the challenge for theorists is how do you describe that in a, in a tractable way? How do you mitigate these effects? But maybe even more interestingly, these things seem like they should be bad things. Could they actually be good things, right? Could I turn what looks like a negative into a positive? Could I use noise and dissipation in the environments of these different systems as a resource for doing interesting things that I couldn't do without them? Okay, and the last thing I'll just say on this slide is a little plug for you, Chicago. If you have any interest in this general area of engineered quantum systems, UChicago has sort of invested heavily in sort of building an institute in this area. There are many, many openings for students and postdocs. So I'd encourage you to check out this, uh, this webpage here. Okay, so that's the big picture interaction. Let's go back to the specific thing that I was telling you about. We'd like to somehow realize and create these crazy interactions between two systems or two particles that are unidirectional, that only go in one direction. Okay, so let's think about this in the simplest possible context, right? Let's go back to freshman physics. What's the simplest kind of interaction I could imagine? Well, my two systems are two masses, M1 and M2, and they're coupled by a spring, right? So we know that when we think about the forces generated by this spring, we know about Newton's third law, right? And we could call that a kind of reciprocity. If I displace these two masses, right? Both of the masses feel a force, right? And the forces, 
equal in magnitude, opposite in sign. So to be really explicit, look, if I do this displacement, mass one feels a force that depends on what mass two is doing, where it is, and vice versa. So to phrase it very simply, what do I want to do? I want to have a kind of crazy spring where as far as mass two is concerned, everything looks like a normal spring. You displace the spring, there's a force. But for mass one, there's no force at all. Okay, so the goal on some level is, can I actually, even at some consistent theoretical level, construct a spring like this, where there is a kind of influence, right, that's mediated by the spring between these two objects, but it only goes in one direction. So on some level, mass two knows something about the position of mass one. Mass one doesn't know and couldn't care less about what mass two is doing. Okay, so on some level, this whole talk is about realizing these kind of crazy springs, doing it in a way where it makes sense quantum mechanically and doesn't violate any basic tenets of, of quantum mechanics. So how do we realize this? What's the basic physics? What new phenomena comes out of this? And again, could this be useful, right? And again, if you could realize one of these crazy springs, there's just one kind of question you could ask. What if you had an array of these crazy springs? So one interesting basic question you could ask is with these unidirectional interactions, how do particles or energy actually propagate? That's something I'll come back to at the end of the talk. Okay, so we wanna make this quantum mechanical, right? So let's stop talking about springs. Let's talk about a very, very simple kind of quantum model. So let's imagine having uh, a simple model we might use to describe electrons, you know, in a solid, right? So let's write down a kind of simple tight binding model. So each circle here labeled by an index is a site in a lattice, or maybe it's a, you know, some resonator. And we have an interaction that can basically move particles back and forth between those sites. So we have this simple looking tight binding model, CJ destroys a particle on site J, Cj plus one creates a particle on site J plus one. Could be fermions or bosons, doesn't matter for this discussion. What do we know? We know that the Hamiltonian should be Hermitian, right? So the magnitude of this coefficient that describes rightward hopping and the magnitude of this coefficient have to be the same, right? Maybe the phases are different. Maybe this is the complex conjugate of this, but the magnitudes have to be the same. Great, so one of the great things about being a theorist is you can just write stuff down and see what happens, right? And maybe they'll even celebrate you and name that crazy Hamiltonian after you. So you could imagine, what if I ignore this rule here? What if I just make this coefficient T plus delta, delta is some real constant, and make this coefficient T minus delta? Okay, so yes, that's a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian now, Right? But again, that does not stop a theorist from studying it. And so this is something that, you know, I think most famously was studied by uh, David Nelson and I think his student at the time, uh, Hatano. This is now known as the Hatano-Nelson model. Okay, so this is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, right? H does not equal H dagger. Um, you could just study it as some big matrix. It has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. All sorts of crazy things happen because you've broken the hermeticity, right? Imagine the extreme case where delta is equal to T, right? This somehow describes a system where particles can only move to the right. I'll tell you about some of the consequences of this, but the first thing you might ask is, well, fine, you write down something ridiculous, ridiculous things happen, right? Before we go into that, how on earth would you actually realize this, right? How on earth would you tell an experimentalist to build something that actually, you know, has the physics described by this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Standard quantum mechanics requires Hermitian Hamiltonians. If I want to get this physics somehow without breaking the rules of quantum mechanics, that's not something I want to do, right? I need to think a little bit harder in terms of what does this really mean? Okay, and that's what a lot of this talk is going to be about. I should also say because the, you know it's a you know it's a nice uh, number of people on the call. If people have questions, feel free to stop me. Right, uh, having things be interactive. Hey, Ash, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So, so when you talk 
about this one uh, reciprocity breaking. Uh, uh, so does the name come from this on Sagar's uh, reciprocity theory? Yeah, so if you hold on okay. like three, you know, maybe four slides. Okay, sure. Yeah. Th th these words, non-reciprocity, they're often used in a different context that I'll, co I'll connect to in just a second, right? Okay, sure. Right. So on some level, think of the concrete examples more than the names right now. Clearly there's something weird in this Hamiltonian. Clearly there was something weird in this kind mm -hmm. of spring I tried to describe to you, okay? Right. And um, actually one, one, one more thing on this, uh, yeah. this HN model. So let's say if you think of, even if you set T equal to Delta and then think of, you, you, you cannot, this is not a legit model for a chiral fermion, right? Well, I, I would say your problems are even bigger, right? This is a non yeah. Hamiltonian, right? So right. depending on who you are, you're okay with just studying models like this, doing field theories based on models like that. I personally you know, take the point of view that before I start doing some theory, I wanna make sure all of the objects I'm studying are well-defined and well-motivated, right? And what I'll try to tell you is there is a way of motivating studying this, right? Without having to break the rules of quantum mechanics. Just to be completely fair, in the original Hatano Nelson uh, paper, this was motivated by starting with a classical uh, model and then using the correspondence between classical stat mech, stat mech and quantum mechanics in one less dimension, mm -hmm. right? So there was a motivation for studying this kind of quantum non-Hermitian model that came from a related classical model. But these days it's sort of in vogue to sort of uh, study these as legitimate quantum models and, mm -hmm. you know, legitimate to ask, what exactly do you mean by that? Cool. Right, thank you. Yeah, so the, the whole, you know, the whole bulk of the talk is, I call this synthetic quantum non-reciprocity. How do I get these funny one-way interactions? How do I give a recipe to an experimentalist to actually realize this? And then of course, why do we want to do this? What are the consequences of the physics? So this connects to, I think, Saram's question this term non-reciprocity, right? The way that it's normally used and thought about, and there's even theorems associated with it, it's not in the context of non-Hermitian Hamiltonians or interactions between systems. It's normally in the context that's sketched here. It's normally in the context of wave propagation and wave scattering. So this is my theorist depiction of some optical or um, you know, microwave device there's some magical box that's connected to transmission lines or waveguides. I have a linear scattering problem. So I have waves coming in with these blue amplitudes, waves coming out, let's just say at one frequency with these red amplitudes. I could describe the system with a linear scattering matrix. How are the out waves related to the in waves? And so non-reciprocity is sort of having a scattering matrix where I can go from left to right this coefficient here, but I can't go the other way, right? I have a zero here, okay? And this is, again, to people who do optics, this is the well-known scattering matrix of an isolator, a very well-known optical component. So this is the context where these words reciprocity are normally discussed. There are theorems about, you know, um, needing to break time reversal symmetry to basically get sort of devices like this. What I'm gonna to try to convince you is, even though we understand a lot of this physics in terms of scattering problems, thinking of it as a kind of Hamiltonian problem actually has a lot of virtue, okay? And again, the standard way of building devices like this, you need to break time reversal symmetry. So if I wanna get something like an isolator, standard routes are, you know, have a magnetic field, you have sort of uh, Hall effect physics, you have the cyclotron motion, you have a sense of circulation. This is a schematic showing how a Faraday isolator works. So by breaking magnetic field, by using magnetic materials, magneto-optic materials, that's typically how you build devices like this. And again, devices like this are important. This is from a Thor Labs catalog. These are all examples of devices that realize this kind of scattering matrix. Um, they're useful to protect signal sources and optical networks. They're useful to get rid of reflections. In the world of superconducting circuits and qubits, these 
non-reciprocal devices. So that's what this thing here is. This is a circulator, right? Things coming in can only leave, right? If they propagate, in this case, uh, counterclockwise. When you're trying to measure a very delicate superconducting qubit, right? You send in some signal, it goes to the qubit, it picks up a little bit of a phase that knows about the qubit state, it makes it to this amplifier. You don't want noise generated by the amplifier to make it back to the qubit. Okay, so these devices are incredibly important. For these superconducting qubits, there's a problem using this strategy of magnetic fields. So this is the size of one of these circulators. Here's a US quarter, right? That's pretty big. So if you want to build a device that you know has many, many qubits, this is not a good thing to have to put in. And also, these are superconducting qubits. Superconductivity does not like magnetic fields. These things use magnetic fields. They're, they use ferrites. They don't play nice with the superconductivity. So if you had another way of realizing these devices that didn't use magnetic materials or external fields, that could potentially be really useful. So what's the, what's the simple idea? Well, let me just try combining the two things that I've told you about. So we'd like devices like this. There's some magic stuff that gives this very asymmetric scattering relation. Let's put in that magic box of, of stuff, let's try to put one of those non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, right? So some Hamiltonian that maybe describes two modes, two photonic modes, where for some reason, it's easier to tunnel from one to two than from two to one. Okay, so if we could do this, if we knew what this meant and how to build this, maybe this is a new design principle for building these kinds of devices. But of course, we're still stuck with the same basic question. Uh, what exactly did this mean? How would I build it, right? And what I'll tell you is, and this connects to the, maybe the very first slide I showed, what do we usually mean when we're writing a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, whether we acknowledge it or not, we're normally describing dissipation, right? And so what does it mean to engineer something like this? It means that for our system, we wanna very carefully control and tailor how the system couples to dissipation. Okay, so what I'll tell you in a little bit more detail, if I introduce dissipation in just the right way, I can effectively get this non-Hermitian, non-reciprocal Hamiltonian. Okay, I should also say, I'm gonna describe everything in a very quantum language. A lot of the ideas that I'll be telling you about are related to something that has got a lot of mileage in sort of classical photonics and sort of classical um, you know, even microwave engineering. It's the idea of breaking non-reciprocity by time-dependent modulation of a system. And so Andrea Olu and colleagues are sort of leaders in this area. They have a nice uh, review paper on that kind of physics. So let's go back to this very, very simple two-site version of that weird type binding model, right? So I have some asymmetry in the hopping, this epsilon. If I rewrite this Hamiltonian, there's the good part that's Hermitian. There's the bad part that's not Hermitian. How should I think about this bad part? The way I should think about it is this is actually an interaction between these two modes that is mediated by something else. What is that something else? I'm gonna be very vague and mysterious. That something else I'm gonna call a dissipative bath. So my cartoon is I have these two modes that are now coupled together with just an ordinary Hermitian Hamiltonian, the green stuff. To get the mysterious red stuff, both of these modes are gonna be coupled to some external reservoir. And for the intents and purposes of this talk, what's an external reservoir? Particles can go into this bath and never come back, okay? It's just some place, it's a source of loss, right? Where I can suck particles out of my system. So I can imagine describing the interaction of this bath and these two modes with the Hamiltonian. So this big B dagger will create an excitation in the bath, but now I'm gonna couple it to my two system modes in a very special way. So I can create an excitation in the bath, and it, when it goes into the bath, it never comes back, either by removing, and let's call these modes photonic modes, right? I can either take a photon from mode one, or I could take a photon from mode two, okay? And so there's a kind of almost interference 
in terms of how you could create an excitation in the bath. And you also notice there's an eye showing up here. That eye is going to be crucial. That eye is basically encoding the fact that to really get this kind of physics, yeah, I need to break time reversal symmetry somewhere in the problem. Okay, so in a very simple way without too many equations, how should I think about this? Well, look, if I have two harmonic oscillators, A1 and A2, I could work with a new set of normal modes, right? I could call some linear combination of A1 and A2, right, up to a normalization. That's some new lowering operator, right? That's some new, you know, uh, normal mode. And then this interaction looks much simpler. You take a quanta out of mode C and you put it into the bath and it disappears. So then that's kind of an interaction we know about classically. That's kind of a quantum picture of damping, right? Just sucking energy out of a mode. So what kind of dynamics does damping give me? Well, in the simplest case, damping just causes amplitudes to decay exponentially in time. So I'm using tau here for time, not to get confused with the T over here. So we expect that this bath has a really, really broad density of states, this very, very simple damping dynamics for mode C. So now if I know how mode C is influenced by the bath, right, this is a piece of algebra I'm sure we can all do, A1 and A2, right, are linear combinations of C in the orthogonal mode, I can figure out what the equations of motion are for A1 and A2, okay? So what are those equations of motion? Well, first, there's the part just coming from the Hamiltonian, right? Just using the usual Heisenberg equations of motion. So I have this normal tunnel coupling, we might call it, between A1 and 2. You see this little t. But now this simple damping physics of mode C, when I rewrite it in terms of A2 and A1, it actually gives me a coupling between the two modes. But the sign of these terms flips as I go from mode one to mode two. So I'm saying something very not mysterious here. If you couple both these modes to the same bath, the damping force produced by that bath is not local. So that damping force actually couples the two modes, but that coupling has a different symmetry when I compare the equation of motion for mode one versus the equation of motion for mode two. So now you see basically a way of getting the, the physics we want, right? We see that the effective coupling between mode one and two versus two and one, I have the same asymmetry that I had in the starting Hamiltonian. Okay, so the upshot is to get this weird non-reciprocity, non-hermeticity, there is a very concrete recipe. You need to couple to dissipation in just the right way, okay? Uh, I have a technical question here. Yeah. So, so you're basically writing a Lindbladian, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to write down actually the Lindbladian in like literally two slides. So this is it. This is the level that let's call it hand wavy theory. Right. Right. Like if you really want, there is a one to one. Yep. So there right. is a in principle there is a one to one mapping between a Lindbladian and a non Hermitian Hamiltonian in a higher in a in an enlarged space, right? You can rewrite. Uh, Lindbladian as a exactly as a Schrodinger evolution with a non Hermitian Hamiltonian by just flattening out the density matrix into a vector and all that. So that is that the so there is a one to one connection between this Hamiltonian, the non Hermitian Hamiltonian that you have written, or whatever Lindbladian, so the, or there is a some the, the Hamiltonian you're thinking of would not be this Hamiltonian. Okay, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll write down the, the Lindblad master equation in, in two slides. Okay. Sure. I'll come back to your question. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. So this is really at the level of just trying to, to be honest, all of this, I don't need the hats. There's nothing quantum here, right? This is all yeah. coupled harmonic oscillators, right? This is just to tell you that this might seem super mysterious. You can reduce it to a problem of introducing damping forces in just the right way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that... You know, and then you also see the recipe if you really wanted complete non-reciprocity. What if I want two to be influenced by one, but I want one to not know about two at all? I would basically balance this ordinary Hermitian tunnel coupling against this induced damping force. 
And at the level of this physics, right now, everything is linear and nice. The correspondence to classical physics is really nice. The only place quantum mechanics shows up is, you know, quantum mechanics, you can never escape the fluctuation dissipation theorem. If you have damping, there has to be noise. There will at least be vacuum noise. So if you wanted to make these equations legitimate from a quantum point of view, you would have to add noise terms. So classically, we think of these as Langevin noise terms. Quantum mechanically, these become uh, Heisenberg, you know, these become operator valued white noise. But there is a way of even making sense of these equations quantum mechanically. Okay, but the big point here is we're going to now generalize this to get this non reciprocity that you could just write down in this Hamiltonian, but not really know what you're talking about. There's a systematic way to couple to dissipation to give you that asymmetry. Okay, and the non hermeticity that was sitting here corresponds to introducing dissipation in a, in a very particular way. Let me so pause. The fluctuation is gamma and psi related in the using this, uh, is this uh, fluctuation dissipation? Absolutely. So the size of these noise terms are related to the size of gamma. As I make the gamma bigger and bigger, you know, these things, right, will have a. Uh, their operator valued white noise and the strength of that white noise is proportional to gamma. One way of thinking about it is I can't just have decay, right, of Heisenberg operators because canonical commutators need to be yeah. preserved. And the noise is cooked up in just the right way to make sure that that still holds up. Yeah. Sorry. Let's, let's take this recipe and try to, so is there another question? Yeah, I think the gamma is actually related to B dagger B uh, spectral function or something. Absolutely. And the limit that I'm thinking about here is the limit of like what we'd call an extreme Markovian bath, <laughs> right. where the density of states associated with the modes that make up this B operator. Think of B as being the sum of a whole bunch of harmonic oscillator lowering operators. The density of states of those harmonic oscillators is completely flat and has an infinite bandwidth. Right. So that limit, this becomes white noise. So this extra noise, I one and I two, are coming from the Markovian bits, non-Markovian bits, or what? I mean, you just said no, it so has to be self-consistency requires gamma to be uh, that, controlled that, by that noise is coming from the properties of this bath. So the bath, just like we would have classically, the bath, oh. sort of, its linear response is what gives me the damping. The fluctuations of this B. Right. Dagger or what gives these noise terms? So I can write all of them as correlation functions of these eventually. Yeah. So the the statistical properties of this noise are determined by properties okay. of this B. Yeah. And this is this is like a really well established formalism, mm -hmm. let's say in quantum optics. This is people call it either input output theory or sort of the Heisenberg Langevin treatment of noise. Uh -huh. But what I'm going to tell you is this is all much more general because <laughs> this is not a convenient formalism for a lot of problems, right? So this is all much more general. The crucial idea is this balancing of an ordinary Hermitian interaction and some weird interaction induced by dissipation. That is much, much more general. So this is something that uh, with this former postdoc, Anya, we worked at a couple of years ago. Imagine you come to me with two systems. I'm calling them one and two. Whatever you want them to be, they could be bosonic modes, fermionic modes, who knows? And imagine you come to me with a Hermitian Hamiltonian interaction between them. So this is some operator for system one. This is some operator for system two. Maybe they're Hermitian, maybe they're not. This is an ordinary Hamiltonian coupling between these two systems. Imagine you want to make that interaction now one way. So you do not want two to influence one. You want one to influence two the same way it would according to this Hamiltonian. There's a very, very general way to introduce dissipation, correlated dissipation for both of those modes to realize it. And a nice way of describing that, this is what Sriram was getting at, is to not write down equations of motion uh, for operators to write down an equation of motion for the quantum state. So the state of mode one and mode two, that's now encoded by the density matrix of those two modes. Or if you want, it's a reduced density matrix where I've traced out the degrees of freedom of the bath. And you basically have the same two ingredients in the equations I had before. 
So this is the ordinary Hamiltonian kind of unitary evolution from this Hermitian uh, matrix or Hamiltonian. These funny terms encode the dissipation. So this operator Z, which is often called a jump operator, this encodes exactly how are those two modes coupled to the dissipation. Okay, and so you can uh, trust me at this level or read the paper. This will give you a non-reciprocal interaction between the two modes. If you exactly balance the dissipative interaction that's sitting in these red terms with the ordinary coherent interaction by picking big gamma to match this Hermitian interaction, you can rigorously show that system two is influenced by one System one knows nothing about system two. So the reduced density matrix for just system one couldn't care less about anything you do to system two. Okay, and if this is still not general enough to you, you can even make this more general. You don't need this to be even in the Markovian limit. There's a way of rephrasing this equivalently and maybe even more generally in terms of a functional interval. Okay, so for the theorists in the audience, there's a Keldish way of rephrasing all of this structure. But the basic physics for getting about equations, to get this non-reciprocity, you balance a coherent Hamiltonian interaction with an interaction that is mediated by a common coupling to a back. So okay. is, is, that, is, is that a... Is, Go ahead, sorry. Is there a... For the, precisely this particular condition of gamma equal to two lambda, is there a special aspect of fluctuation dissipation theorem that it reflects this particular setting or that fluctuation dissipation theorem is kind of on its own? Yeah, so I would say like on some level, there's certainly no notion of thermal equilibrium here, right? Um, mm. In this equation, this could definitely describe a bath that is not thermal at all. The I most see. basic okay. level of fluctuation dissipation when I wrote these equations the commutator of A1 and A1 dagger has to be one, right? So I need some noise in these equations to make sure that's there. I can't just have damping. The equivalent statement on some level in this equation is this row always has to be a good quantum state, right? Probability has to be conserved. If you just write down a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian and write e to the minus IHT and evolve, that thing is not unitary. Yeah. Probability is lost. and so. If you're the kind of person that's bothered by probability just disappearing, and I am that kind of person, this is a way of thinking about that physics where, you know, you always have a valid, reasonable quantum state at every point in the evolution. Yeah, so trace row is uh, equal to one, basically. Sorry, go ahead. So trace row should be one always throughout. Yes, and, and more than that, rho should be positive, right? right. So you can always think of it as a, this structure guarantees that. But Suran, your question was, where is the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian lurking in this? So yes. this is a coherent Hamiltonian. These terms, right, where the Zs are on one side of the row or the other, I could formally lump that into this H. If mm -hmm. I write this now as some H row minus row H dagger. Right. So these terms combined with this are exactly the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, that Hatano nelson thing that we had before. You could think of these terms then as encoding the noise that has to go along with that. But it's it's it's, it's in the enlarged space, right? So the so it's uh, since you are putting the left action on the right uh, or sorry right action on the left, so the effective Hamiltonian that non-Hermitian Hamiltonian you'll get will have double the degrees of freedom, right? No, so, no. So I you could do that. I think in most cases you don't really learn a lot by doing that. That's just yeah, yeah, yeah. about this. What I'm doing is I'm not doing that at all. I'm just saying the Hamiltonian like terms in this equation, all of the operators act either on the left of row or on the right. So this, I can never write like that because there's a Z and a Z dagger. Yeah, yeah. This I can write like that. So this, I can lump in with this and rewrite this as not h rho minus rho h, but some h effective rho minus rho h effective dagger. And if you do that for the this asymmetric hopping, you exactly get the Hatano Nelson type Hamilton. But you still can have the first term as a bath. You cannot do away with that, right? No. So this term here is like the noise that sort of 
make sure everything is okay. Okay, okay, that is very clear, thank you. And the one other really interesting thing I'll point out, <laughs> there are systems where even if you do this trick, you take this stuff, you lump it with this, you get a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian or you think, that has no non-reciprocity, but this structure still gives you a completely non-reciprocal interaction. So this is actually more general, right? than just writing, trying to describe these one-way interactions by writing a, a non-reciprocal interaction. So imagine I have, um, you know, I, I don't know, two quantum dots or two cavities. Imagine I want a density-density interaction. So N1 times N2, where N1 is the number of photons in mode one, N2 is the number of photons in mode two. How do I write down a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian where that interaction goes in one way? Right? There's, no, there's actually no simple way of doing it, right? This structure though, can make that kind of interaction non-reciprocal. So this is much, much more general than what our starting point was. Right. Mm -hmm. Another question, uh, usually in the Lindblad equation, you have a sum of terms. It, your red terms is actually a sum of terms. Here you only have one. Is that an approximation or a property of this specific realization that you have? So the, you know, the point, and this is almost like the, the thing that, you know, some of us, it's not the way we normally think about problems. Normally the problem is you're an experimentalist, you come to me with some system and there's some nasty dissipation and I have to try to derive this equation to somewhat accurately describe that dissipation. We're doing things backwards, right? I wanna construct some dissipative evolution that gives me the dynamics I want. So what I'm basically saying is, if you come to me with this Hamiltonian and you wanna make it unidirectional, I just need one dissipator, right? So I'm not, I'm not starting by trying to describe some actual dissipative environment you've come to me with. I'm trying to tell you, this would be the ideal kind of dissipative um, you know, evolution to realize somehow in an experiment to actually get this one-way interaction. And I'll tell you how to, well, I'll give you an example of an experiment that does this in like two slides. Okay. The other very cute way of thinking about this, here's another easy thing to write down in theory, oops, and harder to realize an experiment. If I have two systems and I want them to interact only from one to two, well, call up your friend who has some topological system with chiral edge states, couple one and two to the chiral edge state, and then it's sort of obvious that the chiral edge state will let one influence two and not the other way around, right? Because look, there's no backward propagating channel here. So in, in a particular limit, the effective theory describing this setup, when you kind of integrate out that chiral edge state is exactly this equation. So another way of thinking about this is, we'd love to have chiral edge states because we could do all sorts of wonderful things, in a lot of cases, those are hard to realize. Here's a trick for mimicking the effects of a chiral edge state. Okay, so you can get all the same physics as far as mode one and two are concerned without actually needing the chiral edge state. So this is a nice picture to have to understand, you know, why are we getting this one-way interaction? Okay, so this might seem uh, all very abstract in equations. Let me just quickly give you an example of an experiment that actually realizes these ideas. So the two systems, again, we have these two modes and these are really gonna be now bosonic modes. B1 and B2 are really gonna be mechanical modes, right? So they're both gonna be mechanical harmonic oscillators. B1 and B2 are like the phonon destruction operators. What is the bath going to be, right? We need some bath that talks to both of them. The bath is actually going to be a resonant mode of a fabry perot cavity that is leaky, right? So I have light between these two mirrors bouncing back and forth. One of the mirrors is not perfectly reflecting, light can leak out. That is gonna be my bath. Okay, so this is gonna be an optomechanical system. You could even imagine it, this is not what the experiment actually does. Imagine you have this fabry perot cavity where both mirrors can move, right? And those X1 and X2 correspond to these two lowering operators. So here in a very cartoon way is how you would generate this, this funny bath mediated interaction. So imagine these two mechanical modes have different frequencies and those frequencies are both much larger than the 
the line width of this cavity. So this is supposed to be the density of states associated with one resonant mode of the cavity. This is that cavity frequency. This is the broadening that comes from the damping rate kappa of the cavity. So omega one and omega two are both bigger than that. So then what do I do? I shine a laser on this cavity that is really detuned at a lower frequency. So detuned to the red, even though I've colored it as blue. And so the idea is, okay, very, very crudely, that laser cannot put photons in the cavity because look, there's no density of states there. The only way it can put photons in the cavity is I, if I have a Raman scattering, right? So if I, you know, if the laser photon swallows a B1 phot phonon, right? That provides exactly the energy that's needed to see this large density of states of the cavity resonance, right? And this G1 is supposed to be the strength of the laser applied at this frequency. And now you could do the same thing with another laser at this different detuned frequency, so cavity frequency minus omega two. Again, the only way that laser can put photons in the cavity is to swallow a phonon, but now from mode two. Okay, so the upshot of this is if I get a photon at cavity resonance, it could have come from either of these lasers through either of these processes. If I put a photon here, it's gonna leak out because of this kappa. That's exactly this correlated dissipation. There are two ways of putting a photon in the bath, either involving mode one and mode two. This is gonna let this bath, this photonic damped cavity, mediate this interaction. So that's half of our recipe. Half of the recipe was we need a bath mediated interaction. The other half is I just need an ordinary Hamiltonian interaction. And then you could do exactly the same thing, right? We're gonna pretend that lasers are cheap. You bring in laser three and four, you also drive at two different frequencies, but now you pick the detunings, you shift everything, let's say a little bit, you know, to the right in this plot, so a little bit positive frequencies. So now you have the same kind of physics. There's two ways of putting photons now on the side of this Lorentzian in its density of states, either swallow a phonon from mode one or from mode two. But now the fact that you see the density of states not at its peak, but you see it detuned from the peak, this is actually gonna generate an ordinary Hermitian interaction. Okay, so if you wanna be more formal, this process sees the cavity susceptibility exactly on resonance. The cavity susceptibility on resonance is purely dissipative. This sees, you know, the cavity susceptibility detuned from resonance. That now, if you want, has a reactive part. That is going to be something I could describe with an effective Hamiltonian. So the upshot in this system is you have these two mechanical modes. You shine four lasers in just the right way. You should be able to have these two mechanical resonators interact in a unidirectional way. Ash. Um... Yeah. Adequate. So uh, you had the you have omega one and omega two far away from the resonance, yeah. right? Now, what happens if these omega ones and omega twos are closer to these resonances? So then the problem is, when you have Raman scattering, right? You have anti-Stokes and Stokes scattering, right? Yeah. So what I don't want is I don't want the process where, you know, this laser one comes in and it emits a phonon into ah. mode one and puts a photon out here. So I want the density of states out here <laughs> to basically be, you know, at a detuning of two omega one to be zero. So if these now start to get too close, and I've exaggerated, of course, the amount of detunings here, you'll get extra basically noise in the process and that's gonna interfere with what we want. So I don't want any density of states for the, for the Stoke scattering, the processes where you actually, you know, create phonons you know, in this light matter interaction. So that's what the detuning lets us do. And, and, and a follow-up is the sensitive dependence to the fact that you have to be on resonance to get this effect versus if you're off resonance, it's not, right? I mean, so like in the cavity language, there is this idea of critical coupling yeah. where you're essentially like an impedance matching uh, business that you're doing. Is there something analogous happening here? So, when I say that like this is exactly on resonance and this is yeah. not exactly on resonance, yeah. 
they don't have to be exactly on resonance and this doesn't have to be super detuned. What you then have to do is you really have to balance the amplitudes of all four of these lasers. And these really should be a G3 and a G4. Okay. So, so what happens in the general case is this process, if it's not exactly on resonance, it generates both what I would call a Hamiltonian interaction and a dissipative interaction. Same thing with this process. You need the net Hamiltonian interaction and the net dissipative interaction to cancel. So if you have enough control over your lasers and Jack Harris was able to do this, this is something you can achieve. You know. Great, thanks. So this is what the actual system looks like. Um, so the actual system, it is a Fabry Perot resonator. The two mirrors are fixed. Um, the mechanical system is a silicon nitride membrane that is basically positioned in the middle of the cavity. So this is Jack Harris's famous uh, membrane in the middle setup. The two mechanical modes are two different normal modes of oscillation of this membrane. So really think of them as drumhead modes, right? And ordinarily these things would not interact the, the nonlinearities of this membrane, the phonon nonlinearities are very weak. The only reason these two normal modes will interact with one another, and again, their frequencies are you know, hundreds of kilohertz, it's through the light field, it's through the cavity. Okay, and just to like, what do they actually see? And there's a lot more in this experiment, I won't get into it. So you could start with a situation where may maybe this high frequency mode is excited and the low frequency mode, this is just the thermal noise at you know, 4.2 Kelvin. And then you turn on the lasers for this gray region, so three milliseconds, which turns on the interaction. And here, nothing really interesting happens. So B started excited, A was not doing much. Okay, both modes get damped a little bit, but there's no real transfer of energy, right? So you do it, you do everything exactly the same way, the same laser phases and amplitudes, but you just change the initial conditions. And now you start with A initially excited, B not excited. Again, the same kind of turning on the lasers configurations. Now you actually see there's a transfer of energy. Okay, and this is exactly realizing this, this one-way hopping. B cannot hop to A. If I have phonons in B, they're stuck there. Phonons in A can hop to B. Okay, and there's a lot more in this experiment. I'm not gonna get into it. This is awfully close to this. Uh, yeah, can this be is awfully close to the, uh, sorry. This is, seems to be very close to the exceptional point circling type experiment, right, in non-hermitian systems. No, is that in no so it's, not, it's not like the exceptional point experiment. You're right in that too. There's a kind of directionality when you, there's no notion of, um, an adiabatic or quasi-adiabatic variation of parameters here. This is mm, not really using any proximity to a, an exceptional point. And both experiments involve something kind of directional, but the reasons I would say are very, very different. Okay, okay, yeah. I would also argue this is a much more robust thing, right? Yeah, yeah of course, not because you're but, yeah. directly engineering the yeah. one effect that you desire out of that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Ash, I, I had a, a question, again, going back to the previous idea. That, so you have the two oscillators and um, you're coupling them to a cavity through the Stokes or anti-Stokes. Now, supposing I, instead of having the phonon modes, I had these as electronic transitions like excitons. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't matter. And now these, I can take two excitons, I can call them a donor and an acceptor, and I can couple them to a common cavity mode. Yeah. Okay, and I can re reach the regime of strong coupling or be coupling depending on how much coupling I have in the system. And I can get a one-way energy transfer in that case from the donor or enhance my energy. There's a, there's a little bit of work going on in this. And I find some similarity to that in what you're saying. So my question is, again, going back to this omega one and omega two, if I was talking about in the exciton language, I could be sitting right at the resonance or close to the resonance and coupling the two. Am I correct? Yeah. So. At a, at a very cartoon level, like using the same ideas, right? But now having the degrees of freedom not being these mechanical modes, but sort yes. of sounds, it should work, right? And and sorry, when you're saying resonance, um, the crucial point is if you only use the cavity, if you only saw the cavity density of states exactly on resonance, 
you wouldn't actually be able to generate this effective Hamiltonian interaction between the two excitons. And in my way of getting the non-reciprocity, I need both of those things. So I do need some detuning, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be infinitely large. Um, I think you do need, I don't think you could get away without having four lasers, right? That's an interesting question, like what the minimal, I feel someone might have even written a paper about this recently. Like, could you do it? Actually, I take it back. I think there's a way of, if other parameters are friendly, you can actually get away by doing this with just two lasers. Um, but that's a, it's a really interesting question. Like these ideas, even though I'm talking about them in really simple settings, they're very, very general. If I go back to that, that, that slide with the O1 and O2 and that master equation, that could be anything. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> and that's actually something we're really excited about, right? Um, that this is a general principle yes. that you can now, you know, try to exploit in a wide variety of systems. Thanks, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no problem. So, um, you know, that was the, I guess the, the main part of the talk. The, the one thing that, you know, I think we're almost out of time unless you want to humor me for three minutes. There was the fun yeah, part of the talk. What's that, sorry, Saron? Take your time. Okay, so maybe I'll like, you know, there's lots and lots of other things you can do with this idea, lots and lots of other systems. This is not just about hopping between harmonic oscillators, right? If that was the end of the story, it wouldn't be such a great story. One of the things we've become excited about is using this idea as a route to, to interesting many body physics or topological physics. So let me just take three minutes and tell you about a connection to, seem, to, to physics that seems completely different. There's a connection between these ideas um, and something we call the, the bosonic Kitayev model. Okay, so here's our Hatano Nelson model that we wrote down. We talked about how to realize we needed dissipation, right? Let's write down a completely Hermitian bosonic model, right? And so again, we have a 1D lattice model. We have some hopping and we have some pairing. And if these were electrons, this would be like a P wave pairing term. If these were electrons and I didn't have the I here, right? This would be the celebrated Kataev model of a spinless P wave superconductor, the model that you know has launched a thousand papers, the model that gives us sort of you know end Majorana zero modes. Okay, so one interesting thing is if you rewrite like you would for the fermionic Kataev model, if you rewrite your bosonic raising and lowering operators in terms of the real and imaginary parts of this A, so in photonic language, what we call quadratures, you also see the same structure in the um, fermionic Kataev model, that across each bond, right, the two different kinds of particles, Xs and Ps, are coupled to one another, but there's a kind of asymmetry, right? One of the couplings is smaller than the other coupling. And again, very crudely, that's reminiscent of this Hatano Nelson model. Okay, so one very, and again, that's exactly what happens in the fermionic case. So one really quick connection to topology, if I had the fermionic model, so if I wrote this and I didn't have the I over here, this is what that Hamiltonian looks like in momentum space. The kinetic energy is a cosine of K, the pairing is sine of K, right? I can think of this as a two component vector, right? As I vary K, well, I have a cosine and a sine for let's say the, you know, the Z and the X component, I can loop out a circle. That's a way of understanding why this model is topology. What's the problem if you make the model bosonic, right? This has to be a cosine, <laughs> right? Why? These things commute with one another. This cannot be a sine of K. So the bosonic version of this model, if you didn't do anything, it's super boring because this is a cosine of K, this is a cosine of K, nothing winds anything. So the simple thing is, this has to be a cosine. This doesn't have to be a cosine. So when I wrote down this imaginary hopping here, that was actually crucial, right? And people had studied this model for bosons without the eye and told, you know, written papers saying this is a stupid model to study. It gets a lot more interesting when you put the eye there. So there's now the possibility of some winding. What's the, the one point I want you to know about? This model, which is completely Hermitian, 
gives me a way of realizing this asymmetric non-remission hopping. I talked about the X's and P's, the real and imaginary parts of those A's. If I write down their equations of motion, the honest to goodness Heisenberg equations of motion coming from this honest to goodness Hermitian Hamiltonian, this is the structure I get. So this E to the two R is parametrizing this asymmetry. Delta is the pairing. And what do you see? Well, the X's and P's are decoupled. So these two kinds of particles don't talk to one another. And I get equations that look like what I'd have in a tight binding model, right? That the amplitude on J is driven by the two neighboring sites, but they're kind of non-Hermitian, right? There's an asymmetry here, not just in phases, but in magnitudes. So on some level, this Hermitian model, no dissipation needed at all, is giving us two copies of this, um, of this non-Hermitian Hattano Nelson model. So way of thinking about it, here's my cartoon. You can almost think of it in a bad analogy to sort of a quantum spin hall physics, right? That you have a chirality in the system that is tied to some other degree of freedom. So in this system, if I abuse notation and call the X's particles, they wanna to go to the right, the P's wanna to go to the left. Okay, and each one of those degrees of freedom on their own are described by this kind of Hatano nelson model. So this is actually a much more general idea. If you have bosonic pairing terms, right? Terms like A dagger, A dagger in a Hermitian Hamiltonian, that's a route to getting non-Hermitian physics without any dissipation at all. So you can actually probe this. You could really do a transport experiment and see this chirality. If you control the phase of light you inject into the middle of this lattice, whether it comes out on the right or the left, will depend on did I inject an X or a P. You can control that by just setting the phase of the laser you send in. There's an absolute phase reference in this model that's controlled by these pairing terms. Okay, so this is not just, again, this is something you could test in an experiment. There's even a preliminary superconducting circuit experiment that has seen some of this. The last thing I'll just say, and uh, this is sort of one of the most shocking hallmarks of of non-Hermitian physics. So when we think about something topological, the first thing we ask is what happens when you change boundary conditions? So if I take this model and I compare a ring, periodic boundary conditions versus open boundary conditions, what's the difference? And normally we'd say, oh, well, in this case, maybe I get some nice zero modes. So you don't get any zero modes, edge modes in this bosonic model. You get something even weirder. So this is the spectrum of this model. And by that, I really mean it's dynamical matrix, right? So get the equations of motion for A and A dagger for this system. That's some linear set of equations. There's a dynamical matrix, diagonalize it, you have eigenvalues. In the case of periodic boundary conditions, the eigenvalues you get form this ellipse in this complex energy space. So the eigenvalues are, have imaginary parts. When you just cut the ring at one point and you make this chain, the entire spectrum changes. So it's not like, oh, I have the periodic boundary condition result with a couple of extra modes. Everything is completely different. Okay, so this has been referred to as the non-Hermitian skin effect. This happens in this completely Hermitian model. We have some work showing how you could actually use this to build a very nice sensor. It's a pretty dramatic effect. In this setting, there's a very, very simple way of understanding where it comes from. So if I have periodic boundary conditions, this is sort of the way I should, um, sorry, this is for open boundary conditions. So when I told you about the propagation in this lattice being chiral, there was another element I had to tell you. So not only when R is really big, are these X's really moving to the right, they're moving to the right with gain. So as this excitation propagates, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if it goes the opposite direction, the wrong direction, it gets smaller and smaller, okay? And so if I have open boundary conditions, I grow as I move to the right. If I'm an X, I shrink as I go to the left. There's never any instability, right? And so all the eigenvalues are real. If I have periodic boundary conditions, I just keep going around in the same direction. I have instability, 
That's the origin of these imaginary eigenvalues. Okay, so this just gives you a flavor of these ideas, even in a, you know, in a lattice system where topology is an interesting thing to look at. These ideas can really change the physics from the kind of reciprocal systems we're more used to thinking about. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna put up my conclusions. Um, yeah, let me stop here. Hopefully I've given you a flavor of this line of work, why it's interesting, why it's surprising, and how there are many more things to look at. So with this, I will stop. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Ash, for a wonderful talk. People are mentally thanking you even. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, are there any questions for Ash? Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so in the uh, in the system that you have shown, um, so let let me begin by this. Uh, like there there are certain like photonic systems of couple cavities, uh, where if you introduce nonlinearity, you can have this kind of. Uh, it's commonly called curve focusing, uh, is because of third order nonlinearity, uh, or even in this system, uh, in the system that you showed, uh, you rely on Raman scattering. Uh -huh. also, uh, you rely on uh, Raman scattering, which is also kind of nonlinear. Uh, so my question is, uh, but in the formalism, in the theoretical formalism that you showed, you don't include any uh, rigorous pumping, like very hard pumping uh, term or anything like, you know, uh, you don't have any nonlinearity in the formalism itself. So my question is, does this thing work at say, for example, a few photon or a single photon level? And if so, uh, is there any prospect of using this kind of system uh, to realize some kind of a Q and D kind of thing, like a non-demolition kind of methods? Yeah, so those are all great questions. And so, so maybe the first thing to kind of emphasize is that when I wrote down this very first little toy model version of this idea, everything mm -hmm. here is completely linear, right? There's no, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no terms yes. on the right-hand side of the equation. But yes. when, why, and you're right, I used Raman scattering. I used some sort of nonlinear process in that experiment. So what is the catch? The catch is I need this I here somewhere. And the easiest, not the only way to introduce that I is to actually have, start with a system with some nonlinearity. So if I wanna use sort of optics language, uh, a Chi two or a Chi three nonlinearity, mm -hmm. drive that system and treat the driven nonlinear system at a mean field level. And then the idea is that the driving mm -hmm. sort of lets you have a phase that's relevant to the system. And this is why I pointed out the connection to you know, these ideas that, that Andrea Alou and others have sort of pursued that just dynamic modulation, right, mm -hmm. is a way of getting non-reciprocity. These equations don't need nonlinearity. What they do need is you need to somehow be able to control the way you talk to the dissipation, you need to get an eye in there, right? That you can't just gauge away somehow. And the simplest way of doing that is to start with some nonlinear system, nice. pump a mode, give that mode a well-defined phase, but then in, in, in optics language, right? Mm -hmm. Just ignore any kind of pump depletion effects, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the only way of getting it, right? The actual physics is all sitting in this master equation. It's at the linear level. But yeah, in that, in this experiment, right, to get those phases, right, it's really the nonlinearity of this Raman scattering process, the fact that I get sensitive to the phases of this laser that lets me get that eye that I need in the trick. So to your second question, all of this stuff works at the, at the few photon level. And that's definitely, this experiment was, you know, definitely not at the few phonon levels, but all this physics works in that limit. Um, and there's a lot of interesting, I think I even sketched some things here. One of the things we've been looking at is you can use non-reciprocity as a new way of, of generating entanglement. Um, exactly what you said, there's actually a very interesting way of um, building QND um, photon detectors. So detecting microwave photons is very important for superconducting circuits. It's very hard to do in a QND way. Yeah. Having non-reciprocity is a way of alleviating some of the problems that exist in other approaches. So yeah, that's a really yeah. exciting direction for all of this. It does work for sort of quantum input states. I see, thank you.
Any other questions? I just had a very vague uh, remark. Uh, your construction with the X's and the P's and the coupled bosonic models in the Kitayev like model yeah. is kind of reminiscent of some toy attempts to replicate a dumping harmonic oscillator with, in classical mechanics, where you end up having two oscillators, one of them stable, the other unstable, a linear combinations of those oscillators, one of them leads to a damped harmonic oscillator. But of course, the full system, if you need the two to make it Hamiltonian, the full system has an unstable oscillator. And it seems that you see some instabilities too in your system when you calculate the spectrum. I was wondering if you have thought of that analogy at all and if it makes sense. Uh, I, you know, I'm not maybe aware of the specific analogy you're talking about, but it definitely makes sense. And like, yeah, this is one of these things where I always find it amusing. Um, when I talk about Hamiltonians, I think you can see my screen still like this, just for a single site, right? Mm -hmm. And when I add the A dagger, A dagger term, and I tell people, oh, if you make this pairing term big enough, this thing is unstable and we need to talk about complex you know, energies. So in a kind of quantum optics or photonic setting, no one has any problem with that because they're used to thinking about you know, parametric amplifiers or oscillators above threshold, right? They know about <laughs> if you have someone on a spring and you start to modulate the spring constant hard enough, yes. you get exponential growth and you build devices. Many condensed matter audiences completely freak out because they're like, uh, what do you mean? You started with a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Why are you plotting uh, complex, you know, energies? Um, so yeah, this is physics that I think is well known and appreciated in a lot of different contexts. Just the fact that you start with something Hermitian, right? And you end up with instability, right? And that formally corresponds to exponential growth in time that corresponds to an imaginary eigenvalue. I think that the connection to like this funny dependence on boundary conditions. So some parametrically driven system that is only unstable for a ring and not unstable for open boundary conditions. I haven't seen an example of that somewhere else. If you know an example, like, look, this is not the world's most complicated Hamiltonian. It would not surprise me if someone studied this so long ago that we've forgotten about it. We've looked, we haven't found an example of that. So there is a systematic way of uh, converting the system into a map, right? That chaos community studies. So you can kind of uh, rewrite this Hamiltonian as a, in terms of a map, like a logistic map or something like that. And uh, and then you can study the phase space portraits of this map whether, and then analyze fixed points and all that. Yeah, but, but on some level that's overkill here. So I haven't put any physics into this model that cuts off the nonlinear, the, the instability. So this is completely linear dynamics. By knowing these eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, I know everything. I think what you're asking is if there is now and again, in, in this language, it's once I go above threshold, what actually determines the steady state, right? Like mm -hmm. if I added some nonlinearity, so for example, if I added Hubbard U's, right, to this model, right. that would then cut off the instability to understand that. You could do it quantum mechanically, you could use ideas from classical nonlinear dynamics. But here, all of the interest is in the linear physics, right? Mm -hmm. right, um, right. And actually, one of the interesting questions is yeah, if you take this model and you add nonlinearity, Right. Yeah, maybe it's sitting on the edge of something nonlinear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, that's all interesting physics, and there's many ways of addressing it, even without worrying about that. And this was like, this was actually a warm up problem for at the time he was a master's student, uh, Alex. And like, oh, just try this, see what happens. And he came back with this, and I'm like, I give you something simple, and you, you come back with this kind of crazy result. This clearly can't be right. So this was never, this was, I was shocked that this turned out to be um, as interesting as it did in the end. And there's also really interesting ways of uh, trying to generalize these sorts of models in the same structure to more than one dimension. Mm -hmm. but there's actually a lot of like surprising symmetry in this, in this model. Um, and one can ask whether that, you can also think about some of these sort of, you know, this is actually the language Hatano and Nelson used, right? You can think about this, um, this non-remission type binding model in terms of like, a, like an imaginary gauge potential. 
right? So then you can also ask questions. If I have an imaginary gauge potential, when can I gauge that away? When can I not? And in this bosonic context where everything is Hermitian, that turns into a very concrete kind of unitary symmetry. So I think there's a lot more to do with these models, even if you don't want to add the nonlinearity. But that's also an interesting thing to look at. Are there any other questions? Actually, I have one question slash comment. So, so I, I, I was at some point I was looking at this uh, integrating out the chiral degrees of freedom from a dynamical system. Like, let's say if you have just a particle, yeah. uh, dynamical particle coupled to a chiral edge, like a dynamical impurity problem, but coupled to a chiral Lattinger liquid, let's say, and then you can make a density density coupling. Which, which is a nonlinear coupling, like dx phi coupled to this yeah. delta function of a, x minus. So actually just by integrating out the chiral boson within a schwinger keldish like formalism, yeah. it, it turned out that it kind of was giving me something like a non-local friction and non-local noise. In, in the sense that you, you have this retardation effect built in this. So within the schwinger keldish you have this x classical dot x quantum term, yeah. right? But then this x quantum dot has this x minus vt like uh, retardation effect. So it's kind of everything became non-local. Uh, ha have you seen people studying this kind of a setup in a beyond Markovian uh, regime? No, but, but the point is you had a density density interaction. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, like, I just quickly sketched that, look, if you integrate out this chiral edge, you will get the same master equation. A crucial thing was the operators describing the coupling of system one and system two, those could be anything, but the coupling mm -hmm. to the edge for this to work out, that has to be linear, right? So I'm I acting see. on system one and then, but what I do here is I basically add or remove a particle. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Like I don't, if the coupling to the chiral edge itself is is not linear so density density yeah i don't even know how to think about that exactly actually it's a, it's a very, I, I, I can send you some notes actually on this i, I never kind of uh, fully contextualizes but what i was trying to understand is that what does it mean to what is a diffusion of that particle along such a system right so because you have this x quantum dot x quantum dot term yeah. sorry x quantum x quantum term which is also non-linear and, and also has this non-local effects. It has some kernel associated it, with it. And, 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 and the friction cannot be, because you don't have friction, right, in a chiral edge. So the only way the friction materializes to ensure that fluctuation dissipation is there is through this non-local retardation type yeah. effect. So if you just follow the schwinger keldish uh, dynamics where you think of your chiral Lattinger liquid as a bath, and you just integrate out the path and then write down this effective dynamics of this particle. Just at a single particle level, you get with density density, of course, you get something non-trivial even for this uh, first two terms actually. So I, I, I just like trying to put into context if people have studied this kind of a setup I in this context, because that's a- Studying that, it sounds- uh... <laughs> because like that also has some kind of a non-reciprocal effects because your quantum quantum is like a noise term, right? Yeah. So your noise also is inheriting the chirality of the sort of the baths that you are integrating out. So it kind of kicks the particle in a certain way. Yeah. 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 No, it sounds like fascinating, but I don't, you know, mm -hmm. not something I've thought about and I don't know any literature on that. Um, I see. Okay. Maybe I will kind of show you this calculation. Yeah. That could be even interesting, even if you didn't have a mobile impurity, right? If you really had two fixed systems, but now they couple to the chiral edge, you know. Yeah. yeah. Way, but but, but really dynamically, even it even more that interesting. To begin with, sounds yeah. that you would get some kind of new structure there. Yeah. Yeah, but dynamics kind of uh, brings out this uh, real time effect of this Keldish theory. So it's like an effective classical theory with this some kind of a bath, which can yeah, be reinterpreted yeah. as some, some yeah. kind of a color, specific kind of a colored noise system. Right yeah. now, it has this kernel now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay, I, I will try, try to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Okay, so any other questions for Ash?
<laughs> cool. Um, oh, yeah. Alex, do you have any questions? Uh, well, um, you talked about the energy and all that. But Waving goodbye. How does the, oh, very interesting. How does the, Thank you. How does the Hilbert space look uh, in, when, when you've lost hermeticity and things like that? How do you go around defining? Yeah, so, so I think one of the, the, of the the way I like to look at all of this is that I don't, act, even though the, the non Hermitian language can be sort of useful at some level, if you really want to think about all this stuff rigorously, you should think about it as a, as a legitimate open quantum system, right? right? So that if there's any kind of ambiguity or something you're confused about, you should always remember that there was a bath and it had its whole Hilbert space and like all of that was there. So there are people right. asking questions like what you're asking where they, they try to formulate everything starting with the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, that, that so then, kind of uh, my head hurt. Like I haven't found so, a good way of. So then in that case, the density matrix, why were you insisting that the trace of rho should be one? Can't you lose to the bat? It's it's not it's all right to lose to the bat in some sense. Oh, but then there's it's a okay. um, <laughs> there's a you don't need to insist, in, uh, Like if I if you give me any quantum state, right? So if my system is entangled with a bath, anything you want, I could always take that legitimate quantum state and construct the reduced density matrix for my system, right? And I will get a positive operator with trace one, right? If I lose particles, that just means I'm in the vacuum for that system. That's not the same thing as just not having the system there, right? So in my formalism, the fact that trace row is one, that whatever that system is, it could be in the vacuum. Right? There might be no excitations there whatsoever, but the system on some level is still there. Uh, and that's just like, you know, standard quantum mechanics. Um, there are people who try to think about if I have a non Hermitian Hamiltonian, can I have a state that's that non Hermitian Hamiltonian at some temperature? So, can I exponentiate the non Hermitian Hamiltonian and put a beta in front of it and, and do something with that? I, again, it's one of these things that no one can stop you from building a theory on that. I don't really know how you interpret that. Um, and I don't know if there's a good answer. I always, I like to think of things as an open quantum system and then all mysteries kind of disappear because it's the way people have been thinking about this for ages. So you're growing solutions in, in, the, in the periodic boundary condition yeah. versus the open boundary condition. Um, so if, if you look at it from a weight packet point of view, will it be, it, it'll grow at the expense of the other degrees of freedom, right? Yeah, in some way, one way of thinking about it is even when I wrote down this initial Hamiltonian, mm. right, a way of thinking about this term and where would it actually come from in an experiment, this is actually like, like imagine starting with a time dependent Hamiltonian where you were really pumping in energy into the system by modulating, like let's say a spring constant of a harmonic oscillator at twice its natural frequency. And then you go to a rotating frame and make the rotating wave approximation. So you should really think of this physically as it's a pumped system. This is putting energy into the system. And thus the fact that you get <laughs> these sort of exponentially growing solutions, there's sort of a classical pump or source of energy sitting in this term. You're just efficiently taking energy out of that pump, right? So that's a nice way of avoiding any, you know. It's also formally like, um, if I wrote down a quadratic Hamiltonian, of a, of a harmonic oscillator and I made the spring constant negative, right? Yeah, right. Also akin to that, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. I have to, thank you, I have to teach now. So. Alex, we met years and years ago. I'm trying to, I have mm -hmm. a, a lap, I'm a lapsed mesoscopic uh, theorist, right? So I remember, geez, I can't remember when it, I think I was a grad student still. Um, right. Yeah. Was it Italy or was it? Uh, most, most probably ICTP. Yeah, it must have been ICTP and it was a really, really long time ago. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> yeah.
Good to see you again. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Or lo- all long lost friends are in city college. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I have three minutes left. I have yeah, to start teaching soon. Yeah. I'll okay, go you. ahead, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Ash, for. It was yeah, really thank nice you for the interview. Yeah, 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 so um, I will try to reach out to you with some questions on this uh, Keldish way of thinking about. Uh, integrating out a chiral edge <laughs> it's like yeah. a chiral caldera legate model so it's like a caldera uh, legate model but but you have a field theory of uh, because you can only write field we, theory we use the keldish way of thinking about things too the interesting thing is yeah i just haven't thought much